Hi there and welcome to lecture 8 for Vice Statistics. So today we're learning about um, extending the linear model past just one variable, one uh, explanatory variable to multiple explanatory variables. Uh, we'll be looking at then how we can test whether those um, multiple explanatory variables are important or not with the f-test and then we'll, we'll move on to look at um, how we can incorporate categorical variables, so qualitative uh, uh, variables in uh, to our predictions. So you recall that the linear model models the mean of an outcome variable um, with respect to one or more explanatory variables. So the idea is that if you know how the mean of the outcome variable changes, then you've explained some of the outcome variation, right? And the other thing we have to remember is that um, we generally uh, estimate a linear model or we fit it to a, a sample of data. And so um, <clears throat> we want to be able to use the information from that sample, so the formula that we generate and the um, relationship between the variables that we see in our sample to infer something about the population, which means we need those added assumptions. So let's remember what the assumptions are. We have four of them. We, um, we assume linearity, which means that the, the trend is modelled correctly. Uh, we assume independence, so that um, the observations are not uh, related to each other, um, related uh, between peers, they're not related to each other more um, between certain peers than compared to other peers. So for example, we don't have things like autocorrelation in time, right? If you measure some, the same thing through time, then the measurement today is more likely to be related to the measurement yesterday than the, than the measurement 10 days ago, right? So that would be a, a situation where independence doesn't hold. Uh, normality, which is the least important, which is that residuals um, should be distributed nor normally, following a normal distribution. That's important if you're doing prediction for individuals, right? Because prediction for individuals, um, we combine the, the estimated average, which doesn't really depend on the normality assumption, with the distribution of the individuals around that average. And that's where we assume normality. And the last one is equal variation. So we assume that um, no matter what the combination of predictors are, the, um, the scatter of the individuals around the, the average would have about the same variation. So the most important, of course, is linearity, which we, which we check with the residuals versus fitted plot. It also allows us to check equal variance, and the other things are, are less important, okay? Um, except for the case where we're predicting for individuals, and that's where it becomes slightly more important. So you remember that we assess the... Um, linearity with a residual versus fitted plot, which we can use the plot command for. So we fit our model, which we've saved as mod 1 here, and then we plot mod 1, and the very first plot that it outputs, which is what the which equals 1 gives, is the um, residuals versus fitted plot. So we've got the fitted values, which is the estimated uh, weights along here. Um, that's the weight given the line, and then we've got the, the scatter about the line. And you can see here that the um, the linearity and equal variation assumptions don't hold and the reason is um, for the linearity is that the average in the y direction as we move from left to right so as we change the the value of the predictor and thus the value of the outcome um, it consistently starts high right so if you go through here it's if you kind of draw a, draw a curve through the data or, or where the average trend is it starts high and then it goes low and then it goes back high again so there's a curve here, right? If you see a curve, then linearity doesn't hold. But we also see that there's a changing scatter around that curve, right? So there's our curve through the middle there. And there's a small amount of scatter here, but it increases. The amount of scatter increases as we go across. So the variation around the trend isn't constant. So both linearity and equal variance here are not met. Um, in uh, lab 8, we looked at a, a different model where we applied a transformation. So um, we, we saw that linearity and equal variance weren't met. So we said, well, how about we um, try to transform the data to a different scale and see whether a straight line relationship makes sense there. So what we did is we, we used the log of body weight versus the log of heart girth. All right, so this is our second model, and we're plotting that in the same way. And you can see here that now the assumptions of linearity and equal variance are met. Right, so if you look for the average trend, it's pretty much flat, so linearity is met, and the average amount of variation is pretty much the same as you go across. Right, so the amount of scatter 
is about the same above and above, below the trend. So this is much better. Here's the model output from that um, model. So we have um, our formula there, we have our coefficients. All right, so we can um, write down the formula would be log of body weight is equal to minus 7.4 plus 2.6 times the log of heart girth. And we can see that this explains a little bit more variation than we had before. All right, so the original model on the original scale, um, the R squared was about 0.8, now it's about 0.82. So we've explained a little bit more variation by fitting the trend better. Okay. Um, now the disadvantage, of course, is that this is a more complicated sort of looking equation. Um, you know, you have to rearrange this for body weight, right? You'd have to exponentiate to get rid of the log. So it'll be e to the minus 7.4 plus 2.6 times log heart girth. Right, it doesn't have a nice, a simple, um, you know, for, for every one unit increase in heart girth, there's a corresponding in, increase in body weight. Instead of it, it's a one unit increase in the log of heart girth, gives you a one unit increase in the, gives you a 2.6 unit increase in the log of body weight. And that's, you know, it's a little bit foreign to us, right? Uh, but nonetheless, it is a better fitting model. And essentially what we've done is actually made a curve. So if you look at the, the data on a log-log scale, so here's the log of body weight versus log of heart girth, you can see that it's actually straight. So what we've done is we've actually fitted a straight line to the transformed data, which is equivalent to fitting a curve to the untransformed data. All right, so there's the curve there that we fit. And you can see that it fits better through the ends particularly. Okay, you remember that a straight line relationship uh, fit okay through the middle here, but was just kind of off at the ends. So um, this is kind of an important point, um, which is that, you know, the straight line relationship was nice and simple. And for the bulk of the data, so in the middle, you know, with um, donkeys with a, with a heart girth of, say, between 100 and 125 or so, um, does just fine. Right, so we know the model's wrong for all donkeys, but it's okay for the, for the purpose of, predicting donkeys in the sort of the middle of the range. It's only wrong for the small donkeys and the really big ones, okay? Whereas this curved relationship is more complicated, we have to use logs and exponentiation and stuff, right? Um, so it's a more complicated formula, but not that much more compli complicated, and it does um, fit better, right? But if all we wanted to do is estimate stuff in the middle here, then the original model would probably be fine, okay? So that's just using heart girth, but we've got a bunch more data that we've kind of completely ignored really up till now, right? So we've got this heart girth relationship, which was the strongest one, which is why we, we used this first, right? The amount of scatter around the trend was, was the smallest, but we've got these other measurements and it seems plausible at least that these other measurements might provide um, information over and above what heart girth does, right? So heart girth, right, the girth um, around the body where the heart is, is gonna be quite a different measure to height. Right, you can imagine a, a two donkeys with similar heart girths, but one's taller than the other. Right, the taller one's going to be heavier. Similarly, um, if the donkey's longer, then it's going to be heavier. Right, so you'd expect that adding some of these other variables in might be might be useful as well. So instead of just using the heart girth, can we utilize information in more than one? Okay, so. Um, the idea is that each of these um, things tell us something about body weight, so perhaps combining them might explain more of the variation in body weight, so we'll be able to give more accurate um, predictions, right? If we, if we explain more variation, then there's l less variation that's unknown, which is the, essentially the amount of variation that you have, the amount of uncertainty that you have in your predictions, right? So by explaining more vi uh, variation, our predictions will become more precise. So how do we do this? Well, essentially what happens is um, we write down an equation that relates the mean of y, the mean of the outcome variable, in terms of the first predictor, plus the second predictor, and so on. Right? We just add on more stuff to that equation. So the equation gets a little bit more complicated, but the kind of underlying principles are the same. We try and we try and kind of find the, the best values of alpha, beta, and beta one, beta two, and so on that that um, that minimize the residual variance, right? Which is fitting the data well, right? If you've got low low um, leftover variation, then you must be fitting the data well. Um, and really that's the only thing that changes, right? So for each of these things, you get an estimate. So we estimate alpha, we estimate beta one, we estimate beta two, and so on, however many there are. 
and we just get extra lines in the output for each covariate we add to the model. Um, I'll come back to this. Uh, let's have a look and see what the um, outcome is. Um, so here we have body weight in terms of four variables, heart girth, umbilical girth, length and height. And you can see that I've just got four lines. Right, one for heart girth, one for umbilical girth, one for length and one for height. Okay. Um, now there's um, two sets of p-values here. We've got the overall p-value. So the overall p-value here is measuring whether anything at all in the model is important. Right, so this is tiny, right? Uh, two with 15 zeros in front of it. So uh, this suggests that something in our model is important, but it doesn't tell us what, right? So all we know is that at least one of the variables, heart girth, umbilical girth, length and height is important. But then we've got these other p-values here. What are they telling us? Well, um, the key thing is, is that they're telling us um, not are this, it, it's, they're not answering the question, is this variable important? Instead, they're as, answering the question, is this variable important? after we've accounted for the other things, right? So um, this p-value for heart girth here, which is tiny, right, is saying that heart girth is important even if you've already measured the umbilical girth length and height and accounted for them. Um, this one is saying umbilical girth is important, it's small, right, even after we've measured all the other stuff. Notice here that the height has a larger p-value, right? And so this is saying that height really isn't all that important, if we've already measured heart girth, umbilical girth, and length, right? So it's not saying that heart, that height is not important, because clearly on our plot that we had before, right, height is clearly related to body weight, right? So our small p-value there is specific to the test: is height important after accounting for heart girth, umbilical girth, and length? So this is basically like saying. You know, if we wrote down the equation relating body weight to heart girth, umbilical girth, length and height, could the coefficient, the multiplier of height, be zero? So could this number here be zero? And given the amount of uncertainty that we have associated with it, the amount of error that's associated with it, it's saying that yes, it kind of could be zero, at least, you know, um, we, we might have got a number as big as this by chance if it was zero in the population about 6.5% of the time. Okay. So our conclusion would be heart girth, umbilical girth, and length are all important after accounting for the other covariates, but height is not important after accounting for the other covariates. So this means that if you're going out to measure a donkey, right, you should measure their heart girth, umbilical girth, and length, and if you've measured those things, there's not really much advantage to measuring height. It's not going to tell you anything more about the body weight than you already have. Now that doesn't mean that height's not important to body weight, clearly it is, and we can fit a model for that, right, just by putting height alone in and we get a tiny p-value, as you would expect, right. What it's saying is that if you're going to measure, uh, if you've measured those other three things, then height doesn't tell us anything over and above that, okay. Notice the uh, other thing that I'll point out is that when we fit this model, our coefficient for heart girth is different to what we had before, so before it was 2.83. Now it's 1.76, and that's because some of these things are these things are all related to each other, right? So once you, um, you know, if you're changing the heart girth, then probably the girth of the umbilicus will probably also change, and maybe the length and height of the donkey will be changing at the same time, right? Because the donkey is growing. And because these things are all related to each other, um, the per unit increases um, in each of these variables are um, red alone but don't really make sense by themselves. So what this is saying is that um, if you have uh, two donkeys that, are, that have the same umbilical girth, the same length, the same height, but their heart girths differ by one centimeter, then the one with the larger heart girth will be 1.76 kilos heavier. Right, so it's an all else equal, um, being equal type thing, right? Similarly, if you've got two donkeys that have the same heart girth, the same length, the same height, but their umbilical girth differs by one centimetre, then the one with the larger umbilical girth would be 0.374 kilos heavier than the other one. Right? Now, generally that never happens, right? If you've got, if you've got a donkey with a larger umbilical girth, then it's probably going to have a larger heart girth as well. So all of these things are, are acting in tandem with each other.
Okay. Right. Um, what other stuff? The R squared um, of the model was higher, right? We've got 0.852, so we're explaining 85.2% of the variation in body weight. Um, and the overall p-value, like I said before, is measuring is anything important in the model. Okay, and that's from this thing called the F-test. You'll notice that in the line there we have this F-statistic here. So what is the F-test doing? Well, what it's doing is it's, um, is it's evaluating the model as a whole. Right, so what it's saying is, um, is anything in our model useful for predicting the body weight of a donkey? Okay. Um, it's equivalent to the hypothesis that are any of the betas non-zero. So the, if you like, the, the baseline hypothesis, the null hypothesis as it's sometimes called, would be that all of the betas are identically zero, so that the body weight is just constant, and it doesn't change based on the height, the length, the umbilical girth, or the heart girth. Um, the alternate uh, hypothesis, the, the thing that we're interested in, is that at least one of those things um, affects the outcome, right? So at least one of the heart girth, umbilical girth, length and height affects body weight. And of course it makes sense that all of them do, of course. And um, we can answer this question as to whether anything in our model is useful by comparing the variation in the residuals, so the variation um, in the leftovers after we fit our model, with the variation that we had um, before we fit the model. Okay? And um, we use the F statistic for this, which is kind of similar to R squared. You remember R squared is the proportion of variation explained, so it's the variation explained divided by the total variation. F is slightly different in that it's the variation explained divided by the variation unexplained. Okay, so instead of the total variation, you've got the variation unexplained down here. And there's some crazy formula for it, right? Um, so the process of doing an F uh, of computing an F statistic and then working out a p-value is called analysis of variance because you're comparing variation, right? You're anal analyzing the variation. Right, so here's our formula, the variation explained divided by the variation unexplained. So the variation unexplained is the variation in the residuals and the variation explained is essentially the total variation minus the variation in the residuals. Right, so this is the kind of the relationship to R squared. So on top, we have a variation explained and on bottom we have the variation left over in the residuals. So as we explain more stuff, what happens is the variation explained increases and the variation unexplained goes down, right? So you end up with a bigger number on top and a smaller number underneath. So the ratio of those two numbers increases, right? Um, so we'd expect F to be large when we explain lots of stuff. What if we don't explain anything? Well, if we don't explain anything, then the variation explained would be zero, and the variation unexplained would be everything, right? So total variation in the data. So we'd expect um, F to be zero. So F equals zero is what we'd expect if our model was completely useless. If our model explains stuff, we'd expect F bigger than zero, okay? And just by chance, of course, F will be bigger than zero anyway in a given data set, right? Because it'll explain a little bit just by chance. And so there's a distribution that basically says how big F has to be before you start explaining things properly, right? I.e. further than just chance would give. And that distribution is used to compute the p-value. Now the only thing we use is the p-value, right? We don't actually care about the distribution in this course. So you'll see down the bottom here, I've got it here, yeah, here we go. Um, we've got this final line here. These are F statistic, 546. So that's the value of F which is clearly not zero, right? It's a number that's a lot bigger than zero. Um, all that is used for is to compute P. And we make our decision based on P, right? So in this case, our overall P-value is really small, so our model is telling us something about body weight. Which is fortunate, because this makes, com makes you know, it's common sense that this should tell us something about body weight, right? Okay. So that's what happens when we have multiple numeric measures. But what about if we have a categorical measure? Well, let's remember what the linear model is doing. The linear model equation is describing the mean of the outcome variable given the value of the covariate. So you remember we have mean of y equals alpha plus beta times x, right? So given the x value, we compute the mean of y. If we've got a factor or a categorical variable or a qualitative variable, Right, with different groups, 
then the linear model is estimating the mean within each group, right? It's the mean of the outcome variable, so the mean of the um, thing that we're measuring, um, as it change, um, conditional on the group that we're in. So what's the mean in group one? What's the mean in group two? So the linear model can, can be used to estimate the differences between groups, for example, which you'll, you'll remember we did with the t-test before. But to do it, um, in order to put it into the linear model framework, we've got to be able to convert that categorical variable to numeric in some way. And we do it just by, um, by adding in this um, thing called an indicator variable, um, which basically is a 0, 1. So it's a binary variable. It's set to either 0 or 1, right? So it's numbers. And we set it to 0 for all of the observations in the first group and 1 for all of the observations in the second group. The equation is then the same as it would be if we had a numer numeric variable. The mean of y is equal to alpha plus beta times z. Okay. Um, so that's our equation. And you can easily see here um, then what alpha and beta represent, right? Because when we're in the first group, then z is 0, right? That's what we said it was. z is 0 for any observations in the first group. And if z, z is 0, then the equation is mean of y equals alpha plus beta to, times 0. Beta times 0 is, of course, 0. And so we get the mean of y is just equal to alpha. So alpha represents the average in the first group. So it's the mean of the outcome variable in the first group. What about when... Um, for observations in the second group. So in the second group, we know that z equals 1, right? Because by definition, that's what we made it. So when z equals 1, you put it into the equation, you'd have beta times 1 here, which is just beta. So your equation becomes mean of y is alpha plus beta, right? So the mean in the first group is alpha, and the mean in the second group is alpha plus beta. So beta represents the difference between the second group and the first group. Right? So we can use a linear model to estimate whether there's a difference in the average, the mean, per group, which is the same as how we use the t-test. So um, if there was no difference, we'd expect beta to be 0. So we can use the p-value from our summary table, right? which is saying, you know, could, could the coefficient of this thing be 0, to do the same as what we used to do in the t-test. Okay, so here's an example. We have... Um, a linear model for body weight with respect to sex, right? So this is um, so this is a factor with male and female donkeys, and we see that we get some output here. You remember that what happens is that the average of the first group um, is going to be the alpha term, the intercept term. So this term here, 121.4. That's the average of female donkeys, which was the first group. Then the coefficient of sex is the difference between females and males. So males are 1.77 uh, kilos heavier than females. The p-value there then measures whether this term here could be zero in the population, right? So the p-value here is saying... Um, you know, is our difference between male and female, is that important? In this case, no, because the p-value is high. Okay, you can also see that this, this model is not very good at, at describing the variation in um, body weight of donkeys, which makes sense, right? The only thing you can describe is the difference between male and female, and we've already said that, well, really, there isn't much of a difference. Okay, so this is exactly the same as a t-test. Okay, so here's the same t-test. Here, and we get the exact same p-value, right? The exact same mean for the for the females, and the difference between these will be that 1.77. Okay. So the intercept is the average body weight for the females. Uh, the way to work that out is to look in the, the way to work out which group it is is to look in the table and see what you can see. So here we see males, females are not represented, so that's what's represented by the intercept. So the intercept represents the terms that you do not see in the table. The terms you see in the table are then the difference from that baseline group, the intercept group, which in this case is females, to the males, right? So that's the difference between females and males, males minus females. Okay.
So the linear uh, model tells us that sex isn't important by itself for describing the variation in body weight, right? The p-value was large, 0.48. So what we observe could just happen by chance, even if in the population there was no difference between male and female donkeys. Now, the key thing to remember is that that does not mean that sex is unimportant, right? It just means that if we treat sex by itself, it's not important. But it may just be that there's so much variation in the body weight due to other things, in particular due to the size of the donkey, maybe the, the age of the donkey, right? That's what's accounting for all the variation in the, in, the, in the body weight, right? And because there's so much variation in the body weight due to things other than sex, it's really hard for us to spot the, the, the difference in sex, right? Because it's, it's swamped by the variation due to the other things. And it'll turn out, and we'll see, you'll see this in, in lab nine, um, it turns out that if, we, if we've if we explained a bunch of the variation in body weight by including um, heart girth and length and umbilical girth in the model, in our linear model, if we then add in sex as well, then we'll find that sex is in fact important. Okay, so we'll see that in, the, in uh, lab nine. So that's how you deal with a, um, a variable that just has two options, right? We put in an indicator variable that you know, is zero for one of the options and one for the other one. What if we have three levels? So what if we have a grouping variable with three groups? Then we need to add in two numeric variables to represent those three groups, right? So what we do is we, um, is we add a new variable. I'm going to call it Z2, which is one if you're in the second group and zero otherwise. We're then going to add in another variable, Z3, which is one if you're in the third group and zero otherwise. Right, so if you're in the first group, you're not in the second and not in the third, so both of those variables, Z2 and Z3, are zero. If you're in the second group, Z2 is one, but Z3 is zero because you're not in the third group. And if you're in the third group, Z2 is zero and Z3 is one. Right, so uh, the options uh, between those uh, variables are either they're both zero or one of them is one and the other, or the other one is one. They can't both be one at once because you can't both be in level two and three at the same time. Okay, and then uh, the linear model is then just written down in terms of both of those variables. And you can see here that the same thing would happen, right? So if you're in the first group, then Z2 would be zero and Z3 would be zero so that the mean of Y is just alpha. So alpha represents the mean in the first group. Uh, if you're in the second group, then you're not in the third group, so the Z3 is zero, and you just get alpha plus beta two times one, which is beta two, right? So you get alpha plus beta 2. So the mean in the second group is alpha plus beta 2, which is the mean in the first group plus beta 2. So beta 2 represents the difference between the second group and the first. And in the same way, beta 3 represents the difference between the first group and the third group, right? Because if you're in the third group, Z3 is 1, Z2 is 0, so that term goes away and you end up with the mean of Y is alpha plus beta 3. So the mean in the third group is alpha plus beta 3, Alpha is the mean in the first group, so beta 3 must represent the difference between the first and the third groups. Okay, so alpha represents the first group, beta 2 represents the difference between the first group and the second, and beta 3 the difference between the first group and the third. Okay, now when we have multiple groups like this, the primary thing that we're testing is, is there a difference between the the, the three groups, right? And that's the same as saying, well, if there's not a difference between the three groups, then all the three groups are the same, so that both of the betas here, beta 2 and beta 3, would both be zero, right? They'd all be the same. So there's no difference between the first and the second, and no difference between the first and the third. So that's the same as saying, is anything in my model, right? The only thing in my model is Z2 and Z3, so it's equivalent to saying, is anything in my model important, which is the F-test or the analysis of variance. Okay, so let's look at a concrete example. We have our petrols data, right, which we looked at before. And we, we looked at the area before. And you remember that the way we looked at area before was, was doing um, paired tests, right? So we tested between A and B, between A and C, and between B and C, and we got conflicting results, right? We could see that there was a difference between a and B, 
um, but there wasn't a difference between A and C or between B and C, right? So A is the same as C, B is the same as C, but A and B differ. Okay? So instead we want to be able to sort of have a single test that answers the question directly, do A, B and C differ? That's what the um, overall F value in the, um, the overall P value from our, from our model gives down here. Right, so we set it up the same way as we normally would, right? So the right wing length we're going to describe in terms of area. And RStudio automatically recognizes that area is a categorical variable, so we want to model it as such, right? So um, one of the groups, the baseline level group, goes into the intercept, right? So the 389.6 represents the average in area A. Then each of the other lines are differences from area A to each of the other groups. So this is the difference between area A and area B. So area B are 60 units smaller than the area A birds on average. Area E is 4 units larger than area A birds. Area F is 9 units smaller than area A birds. So you can see that area F is the smallest, right, because it's the largest negative number. And area E is the biggest, because it's the largest positive number. And the overall p-value is saying, could any of these be non-zero? So are any of the things in my model, i.e. the um, indicative variables for all the different areas, are they important? And it's saying that yes, they are. So this is um, evidence that there is a difference between the areas. Okay, we've only got a single p-value, single hypothesis test that is answering the question directly. Whereas before, when we tried to do it with the t-test, we were doing pairwise t-tests. We had a whole heap of different t-tests and they all gave inconsistent results. Okay, so here's a single test, gives us the result that we want straight away. So the overall p-value suggests that the right wing length differs between the areas. The summary table then um, tells us how they differ, right? So this tells us there's a difference between the areas. Next question is, what is the difference? Then we can use the, the estimate column, right, of the summary table to tell us what the difference is. So we can see the area E are the biggest by four units compared to area A. Uh, area F are the smallest by 9 units compared to area A. Okay. Um, once we fit our model, of course, we can use all of the other stuff that we know about linear models. For example, we can do prediction. Okay, so if we want to know, uh, we, if we want to estimate what the average is in area F, right, we could work it out, right, it's 389.6 minus 9.3, so it must be 380.3. But we also want uncertainty about that. Right? We want to know what the confidence interval for that is. How much uncertainty do we have associated with that? We can use the predict function for that. Right? So we're creating a new data frame that just has the unique areas, so A through F, just a single row for each one, and then we use the predict function with, the, uh, with confidence intervals in order to get a prediction for the mean, right? the uncertainty in the average. So this is the uncertainty in the average in each of the six areas that we have. Okay. Um, we can also visualize the difference um, using the visreg package. Okay, and we'll see this again in um, in lab nine. So the visreg package takes our model object and visualizes it for us, which is a little bit easier, um, I think, than using the summary table. It shows you the same information that the summary table does but it allows you to kind of more accurately see what's happening straight away. So from the summary table, we could see that E was the smallest, uh, B, C, and D are about the same, right, because they're all below A by about the same amount, and then F is also below A by a little bit more. And that's what we see on the visualization, right? So here's E, the highest, then A, then the other three all about the same, and this one just a little bit lower. The advantage of the, of the visualization is that it also gives you the uncertainty bands. Right, so we can see that there's way more uncertainty in um, area C and F because, of course, there's few observations in those categories. There's less uncertainty in A and B because we've got so many more observations. Okay, uh, so next time we'll be looking at how we add um, more factor variables. So at the moment we've kind of only, only dealt with a single one. How do we add more? That's what we'll see in lecture 9.